Hello, I'm Pastor B. Hen of Riviera Apostolic Church, STAT Ministry, STAT being the acronym for such times as this. And tonight I want to put the second Bible study up on our website for you to go along with us. The first one, if you have not watched it, is the plan of salvation. And this one is going to be on baptism in the biblical fashion of the New Testament. We'll start off with the reading of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. When God created man in the beginning of time, he was in perfect communion with God. He was in absolute harmony with everything around him. God created the Garden of Eden to be absolute perfection for this creature that he had created to worship him. And he put him in there so that he could commune with him. And it would be the man's choice to worship him and not just because he was created to do so as the angels were. Once man had done this, he gave man dominion over all the earth and all that was in the earth. And as man began to commune with God, deception came into the Garden of Eden and sin was introduced into the world. And sin separated that perfect union from God. You all know the story of how Adam and Eve was tempted by the serpent and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and gave to Adam and he partook of it also. That set into motion death, hell, sin, pain, suffering, all of the things that man had not known up until that time. But God, in his wisdom, set a plan into motion. And as Abraham was praying unto God, one of the great patriarchs of old, God told him, said, I want you to take your son and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. This was his promised son. This was his pride and joy. This was what he had prayed for and what God had given to him and, had, and made a covenant with him that he would multiply his seed and there would be great nations. And now God is asking him to take Isaac, his son, up on the mountaintop and sacrifice him. So we pick up the story in Genesis tw chapter 22, verses 7 and 8, and and as they are going up the mountain to the sacrifice, the young man speaks to his father, who is about 125, history tells us, and, and Isaac is about 25. And he speaks to his father, and the Bible says that Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went, both of them, together. We all know the story that as he began to sacrifice Isaac, there was a rustling in the brush behind him, and there was a ram there, and God told him, Now I know you are faithful and that you'll do anything that I ask you to. Don't sacrifice your son, sacrifice the ram. But those words were a prophetic word of things to come from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the old dispensation of the law to the new dispensation of grace. God would provide himself a lamb. In the Old Testament, our sins were not remitted. They were not taken away. They were simply rolled ahead for a year by blood sacrifice. And as the blood sacrifice was offered, it was the high priest that was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies behind the veil of the temple to offer this sacrifice for the people. They would bring him their sacrifice. He would keep that sacrifice for days and inspect it in many points of inspection to make sure that it was perfect. And then he would offer this lamb as a sacrifice to roll their sins ahead for a year. We skip forward to Isaiah 53 and 7, and it says, And he was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And he's speaking prophetically of Jesus Christ, who was to be the Lamb of God in the future. 
He said, he shall bring, she shall bring forth a virgin, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, for he says, shall save his people from their sins, which being interpreted is God with us. And many other phrases that, that was, was prophetically announced and given in the Old Testament that came to pass in the New Testament. God could not break his own laws. He had given man dominion, and the dominion was lost by man, and so it had to be taken back by a man. But what was God to do? There was no man that was perfect or sinless. There was good people, but there was no sinless man on earth to become the lamb that would take away the sins. So God created himself a body. He created himself a lamb. He made himself to be the offering. And he lived in that body for 33 and a half years until he was crucified. Upon his death upon the cross, the veil to the temple was rent, the Bible says, from top to bottom. Signifying that the barrier that was created by sin was now broken and we now had access to the direct presence of God Almighty and His glory once again. But sin was still upon us all. So, as He was buried and then arose and ascended into heaven, a new dispensation took place. In the stead of the dispensation of the law, now the dispensation of grace began. And Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us are perfect or good enough to be saved. We have to have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our life. So after Jesus was ascended, as he promised, he sent his spirit to dwell in us, but to receive it, we are instructed to repent and be baptized in His name. I will start off by giving you the definition of the word baptized in the original Greek language. It comes from the word baptismo, which means to immerse, submerge, to make overwhelmed or fully wet. A ceremony ablution, especially or technically of the ordinance of Christian baptism. How is the church baptized in the Bible? Well, let's travel into the New Testament as the, grace, the, the dispensation of grace began and see what happened and how they were baptized in the Bible because the Bible says that God looked at Peter and said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, the plan of salvation. I'm going to give that to you. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But the church that he started in the book of Acts should be the example that we all follow. It was, in fact, Jesus Christ that spoke of this church and of the church that he would create and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So we in this day and age need to stick as close to the biblical church as we can. So we will start in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And we're speaking of the day of Pentecost. And as the, the Holy Ghost had fallen upon the people that were in the upper room and they were, they were speaking in other tongues, the Bible says that they were praying in one mind and one accord. In other words, they were all praying for the same thing. And the Bible says that the Holy Ghost came upon them from heaven as the sound of a rushing mighty wind and set upon each of them. And they began to speak in other tongues and the people that were there were from all nations around. And they said, well, how can these people, being not learned people, they haven't gone to college, they're not, they're not upper echelon like we are, how are they speaking in our language? They asked Peter, they said, what must we do to be saved? And in verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and your children, and all them that are far off, and to the generations to come, as far as you could think, as far as you could imagine. It is for all of them. 
Later on in the book of Acts, we will see where they were talking about the Samaritans in, chapter, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 16 through 17. And for the sake of time, I can't go back and give the whole story on all of these, but please pause the video and begin to read the stories and the back stories and, the, and, and, and all of the scriptures ahead of these and see the full story that evolved around all of these scriptures. But in Acts 8, 16 through 17, as they're talking about the Samaritans, it says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Later on in that same chapter in Acts 8, verse 36 through 38, they're speaking of the Ethiopian eunuch. And he's witnessing to this Ethiopian eunuch. And it said, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Once he believed with all of his heart, it caused him to take action and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And they went down into the water. The next chapter in Acts is chapter 9, verses 17 through 18, and we're talking this time about Paul. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house after Paul had been smoked. And putting his hands upon him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee on the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. Saul was a persecutor of the brethren. He was someone that persecuted the saints. He killed the saints. He, he investigated and hunted them out for slaughter because of the fact that they believed in the name of Jesus Christ. And as he was going to do this, the Bible says he was smoked by a great light that blinded him. And he was told to go to a certain house and he did that. And as he waited there, God told someone else, go and talk to this man. And when they did, they found him there, and they prayed with him, and he was converted. Acts 22 and 16 says, And Paul, and Paul, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. Speaking of Cornelius in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, verse 47 and 48. Cornelius says, Can any man forbid water that any of these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they prayed they him to tarry certain days. Acts 15, I mean, chapter 16 and verse 15, we're speaking of Lydia. She was a rich lady. She was a seller of purple. She was of the high class. And the Bible says that when she was baptized and her household, she, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. In chapter 16 and verse 33, speaking of the, Philipp of the Philippian jailer, the Bible says, And he took them the same hour of the night. He had the apostles in the prison, and they had been beaten, and they were being held there. And, and the Bible says that, that they were loosed. And, and the Bible says that he took them the same hour of the night. And he washed their stripes. And was baptized. He and all of his straightway. Speaking of the Corinthians. In chapter 18 and verse 8 of the book of Acts. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Once again we see 
where their belief brought forth an action of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Later on, speaking of the Corinthians, it said, "Is Christ as he was talking to their them, he said, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gallus, lest any would say that I was baptized in my own name. Here he's letting them know there is no power in any other name. It doesn't matter who it was that baptized you, as long as they baptized you in the almighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Acts 19 and 1 through 5 is speaking of Ephesians, and it said, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then Paul said unto them, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, which is on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. These people had already been baptized by the same man that baptized Jesus himself. The man that is called John the Baptist and he had baptized them speaking of the man that was to come which was Jesus Christ and he said he was baptizing them in the repentance the baptism of repentance unto the man that was to come but he never said the name because he never said the name they were instructed to be rebaptized and so they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ there is a formula of baptism that involves the name. Jesus is the name. It is not the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are simply titles of God Almighty. There are many thousands of titles. You could call him the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley, the Bright Morning Star, the Cleft in the Rock. You can call him many things, but his name is Jesus. All baptisms under the New Testament church in the Bible take place in the book of Acts. Why is baptism necessary? Well, in 1 Peter 3 and 21, it said baptism saves us. It says the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism, some in today's world will tell you that baptism is no longer necessary. That was something that was for biblical days. That it is an outward sign of an inward obedience. But the Bible says that it saves us. It also says that it saves us in Mark 16 and 16. And it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. For if he believeth not, he won't be baptized. John 3 and 3 through 5 says that it is part of being born again. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus saith unto him, and said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was speaking of spiritual things here. And, and there are some that will say, Well, when he was speaking of the water and the spirit, he's speaking of the natural birth where the water breaks when the woman has a child. And then he's speaking of the spiritual of being baptized. But, the, but Jesus made it very clear when he said, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? He said, that which is flesh is flesh, <coughs> and that which is spirit is spirit. He was telling him, I'm not speaking of a fleshly birth. Jesus knew that we knew all about that. Jesus wasn't trying to confuse us. He wasn't trying to make it hard to understand. Jesus wants it to be as simple as it can be to understand because the Bible says it is His will that all should come to repentance and that no one should be lost. 
So when he said that a man should be born of water and of spirit, he was speaking of water baptism and the spiritual infilling of the Holy Ghost. And he told him, he said, that which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh. And I'm not speaking about fleshly things that you're thinking of. I'm speaking about spiritual things. Why is baptism necessary? Because it is partaking in Christ's death. Romans 6 and 1 through 7 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. You see, when you are buried, you bury the old man, the old sinful person that you were. And you are raised out of that water to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. It is symbolic that the old sinful nature has died. And now you are living in a new life unto God. It goes on to say, For we have been planted together in the likeness of His death. We shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Why is baptism necessary? Acts 2.38 once again says it is for the remission of our sins. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because it washes, sanctifies, and justifies. And 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It applies the blood of Jesus. 1 John 5 and 8 says, And there are three that bear witness in the earth, in, in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Why do we need the name of Jesus? We need the name of Jesus because the name and the blood are connected. In Acts 5 and 28, he says, And saying, Did we straightly, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. The name and the blood are connected. And they told him, Don't be preaching the name of Jesus. Don't be preaching that doctrine here in Jerusalem. And they did that anyway. And they told him, They said, you can't do that. We told you not to do that. Because now that we know about it, His blood will be upon us. Why do we need the name of Jesus? Because it brings salvation. Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. The name is Jesus. It is not the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are titles. That is not the name. Why do we need the name? Because it saves from sin. Matthew 1 and 21 said, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Isaiah, as I told you earlier, said, And thou shalt call his name, his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Above all other names is that name, and that's why we need that name. Philippians 2 and 9 Says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That name Jesus holds all the power in heaven, earth, and hell. It right. is the name that is above all names. Right. We need that name because it brings trust and hope. Matthew 12 and 21 said, And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. We are the Gentiles and we trust in his name. We need his name because it brings trust and hope. In Isaiah 42, 1 through 6, it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. 
I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he hath set judgment upon the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that hath given breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thine hand, and I will keep thee, and give for thee a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. That name brings trust and hope. That name brings remission of sins, and that is why we need the name. Luke 24 and 47 says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Hebrews 1 and 4 says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. It is a more excellent name than the angels. That's why we need that name. And why do we need the blood of Christ? Well, in Hebrews 10, verse 2 through 6, if there is no blood, there is no remission of sins. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou hast had no pleasure. The, the sacrificial blood sacrifice of animals was not pure enough to take away the sins. It simply rolled them ahead. But the body that was prepared, it was Jesus Christ and God Almighty prepared that body and he lived in it for 33 and a half years as a sinless sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the earth so that he could reunite with those that he had made covenant with, with the creatures that he had created for him to have communion with. And once again, he wanted to bring them back into the covenant. Why do we need the blood? Because if there is no blood, there is no remission. Hebrews 10, 14 through 22 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's where your sins are completely taken away in baptism. Now where, there is, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. His body became that veil that was ripped and torn and the blood that flowed from it was the offering that he made from the alabaster box of his soul. That was the blood that took away our sins, the perfect sacrificial lamb. It was the veil that was rent and therefore there was no more barriers between us and the Shekinah glory of God Almighty. It reunited us with His glory. It brought us back into covenant. Why do we need the blood? Because we are made nigh or closer to Christ by that blood. Right. Ephesians 2 and 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Why do we need the blood? Because it, we need redemption and forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1 and 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We need it because we are washed by the blood. And in Revelations 1 and verse 5, 
It says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why do we need the blood? Because we are purchased by the blood. Yes. Acts 20 and 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Why do we need it? Because it will prevent judgment. Exodus 12 and 7, speaking of the Passover, it says, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. When Jesus had began to work on Pharaoh to release the Israelites out of Egypt, as the plagues began to get worse and worse, he told him, he said, the next thing that will happen is I will smite your firstborn. And the angel came unto the Israelites and said, look, take the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorpost of your door. And as the angel of death comes along, if he sees that blood, he will pass over that house. The blood of that lamb saved those people's houses and their, their, their firstborns. And today the blood of the lamb saves us from the judgment and the death of sin. Why do we need the blood? Because the life is in the blood. Genesis 9 and 4 says, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Leviticus 17 11 also says that the life is in the blood. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. The blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless Lamb of God, made the atonement to redeem our souls from sin. Not just to roll them ahead for a year, not just to push them in front of us, and, and, but to completely take them away. And the Bible says that when you are baptized and when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that the, the Bible says that, that the Lord takes those sins and He puts them from you as far as the east is from the west. And that's a long way, trust me. <laughs> Nobody knows how large the universe is. The only thing we know is that the universe is continually growing. So God is continually pushing our sins further and further away from us as we go through this life if we are His child. And we have been baptized in Jesus' name. The mode and the method of the baptism is immersion. It is always, in every instance, in the new dispensation of grace, it is always the mode and method of immersion. Matthew 3.16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And Acts 8 and 38 also speaks of the immersion. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both of them into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. There is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism, as I told you before in Ephesians 4 and 5. What is the formula? All of the above scriptures support the baptism in Jesus' name. Baptizing in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gives no identity and it does not apply the blood. Therefore, there is no remission of sins. Acts 4 and 10 through 12 says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The formula is given by Peter as the plan of salvation. In Matthew 16 and 18 through 20, he says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 1 Peter 2, 6-18 through 18. 
It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which is disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. I looked up the word Sion, because he was speaking about, he would lay <coughs> in Sion the chief cornerstone, and it says that it is a hill of Jerusalem, figuratively speaking of the church, militant and triumphant. This church is militant, and this church is triumphant. This church is victorious. God has never lost a battle, and he said the gates of hell shall not prevail ever against the church of the living God. And if you believe, is a phrase that you will most often hear when you are in many churches, and they fail to, 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 to bring it past the belief, but they, you know, they say, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And that is true, but if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are baptized, if you believe, it will bring that action of being baptized. Because if you believe what the Bible said, I've already told you that you have to be baptized. I've read it to you in many instances out of the New Testament that the belief is paired with the baptism and the repentance and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. If you're standing out in the middle of a highway and I tell you there's a truck coming your way and you believe me, you're not just going to stand there. You're going to believe and you're going to move out of the way of the truck. And if you believe the Bible, you're going to believe and you're going to be baptized in Jesus' name. Mark 16 and 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, because then they will not be baptized, because they do not believe. The water and the Spirit are baptism and Holy Ghost. This is another thing that many churches will throw out there. The first one was that if you believe, but then nothing else. This one is the water and the Spirit. Many people will tell you that, this, that the water there that, he, that they're speaking of is the natural birth and the water breaking when the woman has a child and that the Spirit is the, is, is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But in John 3 and 3 through 6, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. He was saying, Nicodemus, you're speaking of, of earthly things, fleshly things. That's not what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of spiritual things. God didn't have to explain to mankind at that time that a woman's water would break when she had a child. They knew that. God knew that. He wasn't trying to confuse anybody. Don't let man confuse you. Don't let, don't let the, the, the lies and the theologies of false doctrine mislead you. That wasn't what he was talking about. He told him, he said, I'm not speaking of fleshly things. I'm speaking of spiritual things. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Another question you will run into many times is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not names. They are titles. You cannot be baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and have any of the power of God applied to your life. Have any of the blood covenant applied to your life. Matthew 28, 19 is a scripture that most of them will quote to you, but they won't quote all these other scriptures, but they'll certainly harp on this one. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What we have to understand is that he said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He didn't say the names. He said one singular name. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. The name of the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the cleft in the rock. They're all 
Jesus. He was the Father of creation. He was the Son of redemption. And He is the Holy Ghost that lives within us today. He is Jesus Christ, God Almighty. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Genesis 1 and 1 said, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. So John goes on to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But he goes on to say, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was that that was begotten and, and lived on this earth and dwelt among us? That, that created everything in the beginning with just His word. <coughs> that was Jesus Christ that He was speaking of. There is no power in the titles. If I write you a check and you take it to the bank, and I write, Pastor, or I write, Fisherman, or I write, Father, or Son, the bank's not going to cash it. Because there's no contract there until I put my name on that contract. There's no covenant there until I sign my name to that covenant, or to that contract, or to that check. The name is where the power is. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we can be saved because there is no power in any other name. Jesus Christ is the name. And He has all power in heaven and earth and hell. And He has taken back that dominion and He has restored that covenant with the people that He loved and that He created in the beginning because it was lost. It matters how you are baptized because with a title there is no validity. Only the name makes a contract valid. Acts 4 and 11 says that neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name singular under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is as Ephesians said, only one God, there is only one baptism, and there is only one way to obtain salvation. It is the plan, it is the keys, it is the rock that Jesus Christ gave unto Peter when he told him, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And as Peter stood up that day and told them, as they asked, what must we do, not what could we do, what, what might we do, they said, what must we do? What do we have to do to be saved? And he told them, you have to repent. And you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Not the rolling ahead, but the complete and total remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is that covenant, which is that promise that God made, of, made to us of the redemption. It's the grace dispensation. It's not the law dispensation. That one, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to improve it. We're now not rolling our sins ahead. Now he's completely taking our sins away from us. And as we are baptized in the name of Jesus and we go down by faith into the blood of the Lamb of God and it completely and totally remits our sins and covers with us at that moment, you are more sinless than you have ever been, for we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity. But at that moment, we are freed from sin. And from that moment forward, we have to live in newness of life. We have to each and every day crucify ourselves and die to sin. And stand before God and say, Lord, I am a mortal man, and I have done something that I should not have done once again. Please forgive me. And as his adopted child that has had the name of Jesus applied to their life. He, as our Father said, my mercies are renewed daily and great is my faithfulness. He is great and merciful and they're renewed each and every morning. That way we can stand before Him and say, Lord, wash me.